Okay, we're back with more ridiculously huge numbers, fast growing, slow growing, ordinals, all kinds of good stuff. So um, this is going to be an exposition, really, kind of one paper of Stanley Weiner, um, but it's it's really cool, and um, and I want to I want to tell you what it's all about, and it's going to extend our usual story further and make bigger numbers. So here's where what the way I want to think of starting it. We we started out by wanting to understand the fast growing hierarchy, the values of f alpha of n for really large ordinals alpha. <coughs> Excuse me. But it was getting bewilderingly large. And uh, in the last few videos, when I started talking about the ordinal collapsing functions, um, we switched to the g alpha of n, the slow growing hierarchy. And that, of course, connected by uh, the fact that g alpha of n it can be thought of as the number of terms in the initial expansion of alpha of f alpha of n. So that was kind of a proxy. And the understanding was, in some sense, we really are wanting to understand alpha, f alpha of n, because that's the biggest number we have yet created at some point. But just to get an idea, uh, a, a pale shadow of that, we did the g alphas. OK, so it's understood, it was understood through all that, that um, g alpha of n was far, far smaller than f alpha of n, um, but that it gave some measure, and in particular, that we could see as the alpha increased, the g alphas were increasing for a given n, and that kind of um, gave us an idea of how big alpha was as an ordinal, and very roughly how big f alpha was. But it was understood that it was just a very, very pale, weak, weak shadow. But here's something that you, you'll find on a Wikipedia about um, the slow growing and fast growing hierarchies. They say, interestingly enough, they say that at some point the G alpha, the slow growing hierarchy, catches up with F alpha. How can that even be possible when G alpha is slow growing? And in all the instances that we've seen, G alpha is really, really, really much, much smaller than F alpha. We, we got up with the ordinal collapsing functions that I was doing in the last few videos, we got up to a point where G alpha was decently big, like like up to F epsilon naught size, but still it was nowhere near what the actual F was. So how can it be possible that G alpha catches up with F? Um, and that's what this particular article is about that I want to explain. But in fact, in the meantime, in doing that, it actually lets us um, have a, a rather different and I think really nicely elegant way of redoing a lot of what we're doing so far um, in in terms of hierarchies of functions and uh, creating uh, fast growing functions and really big numbers. Okay, so here's the key. Here's what that, that catches up with st statement actually means. Um, it's that when alpha is very large, when the ordinal is very, very large, um, even the slow growing function, even G alpha is fast, fast growing. And in particular, if you put in n plus one instead of n, you just ratchet up the input number, the numerical natural number input, you ratchet that up by one, it will be much bigger than G alpha of n. So G alpha of n itself has become quite a fast growing function in itself. And here's what we can actually plausibly have. OK, we still have that G alpha of n for any particular n is much, much, much less than F alpha of the same value of n. But and, and similarly, G alpha of the next value of the input is still much, much less than F alpha of that particular input. But because it's they're both such incredibly fast growing functions of their numerical input n, you can actually have that g alpha of n plus one, even though it's, quote, slow growing, not as powerful as f alpha, just by putting in one bigger input, you can make it bigger than f alpha. So this is really what that means. It means that their values are interleaved as closely as possible. You're never going to get that g alpha of n is bigger than f alpha of the same n. But you can have that you just increase that input by one, and the g alpha leapfrogs over the previous value of f alpha. And so they'll actually kind of alternate. Um, this whole sequence goes on n, n plus 2, n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3, et cetera. OK. So in particular, we've, we've, we've very rarely really worried about these kinds of subtle distinctions about, oh, exactly what value of n we, are we putting in. When you analyze these functions, usually um, it's about the eventual growth rate when you put in really, really big values of n. Uh, now, 
I've also put in things like twos and threes in, in there to demonstrate how powerful they are even when you don't put big ends in. But the theory usually relies on an asymptotic analysis, which is what happens when you put in bigger and bigger and bigger ends. If in that way, basically, we're saying that the, these, this G alpha and the F alpha have essentially the same growth rate, because to get a bigger uh, to make G alpha bigger, you just have to do something that we usually consider pretty trivial, eh, just feed it at one extra, um, a slightly bigger end value. Um, but it's, it, it, I hope that clears up some confusion if you happen to have read that article and are thinking, well, this doesn't make any sense. G, G has to be smaller than F. How can it suddenly become bigger or the same size? This is the way in which they're essentially the same size in an asymptotic sense. Okay, so but it's still not easy to see how this could ever happen because as far as we've gone, G alpha is nowhere near, okay? Um, so what, what do we know? We know that, that if you look, the biggest ordinal we've actually um, looked at explicitly is the bachmann howard ordinal when we used ordinal collapsing functions for that. And we figured out that GBH of N is approximately uh, F epsilon naught of N. And, uh, okay, that's by any mortal standards, that's really a fast growing function, but it's a heck of a lot less than f b h of n. Um, and this was still in the, in the regime where we consider the g to be a very pale shadow of f, okay? So, and even if it's, I, I don't wanna go through a proof of this, but hopefully it's pretty obvious that um, that g b h of n plus one, which is roughly just an f epsilon naught of n plus one, that is still way less than f b h of n. So we're not at the point where the g function is so fast growing that just putting in the n plus one is going to leapfrog it over, over the corresponding f value. So we're really not close at this point, okay? So that means we have to create even bigger ordinals than b h um, and look at the g and the f and see see what we can get. So how would we do that? systematically. So that's one goal we've got. There's another goal that we're going to satisfy at the same time, which is to get rid of these annoying approximately's. Um, it, there's a much more elegant way to relate G and F that I'm going to show you, um, where we get, where we take things like this, and I've, I've been very loose about exactly what the heck does these approximately's even mean. Um, and uh, we can actually take those and we can replace them with equalities. And here's what we're going to have. So, so we're going to look at equations or approximate equations like this, and we're going to make them inequalities. In particular, things that say, I've got some big ordinal. I look at the g function of that guy, and it turns out that that is exactly equal, not just approximately equal, to an f with some smaller ordinal. So here's what we're what we're eventually going to create. It's going to take a while to make it, especially to make it really precise. But we're going to create a function, a collapsing function C on ordinals, in fact, really just certain ordinals. Um, and it's kind of a collapse in the same sense as like ordinal collapsing functions, similar in a sense, uh, such that for certain ordinals, ones that are very, very useful for the F and kinds of Fs and Gs we want to use, that we have G of L, G sub alpha, that function, is identically equal to the F function, but at the smaller ordinal C of alpha. So, for example, roughly speaking, we're going to have that the collapsed version of Bachman Howard will exactly be epsilon naught. Um, and then, and in fact, this will turn into an equation in the souped up cool version um, of ordinal analysis and slow and, grass, slow and fast growing hierarchies that, um, that I'm going to cre create for you. Okay, so let's assume we can do that for a sec. Okay. Um, so, here's one thing we can do that. With do with that. Um, so we start out with some really huge ordinal alpha. Let's say it's bigger than anything we've, we've created explicitly before. It's bigger than the Bachman Howard ordinal, for example. So F alpha, utterly huge, something that is really hard to just directly grasp. Okay, so we do our usual trick and we say, okay, let's think about just G alpha, which is Gives, a, gives us some idea of how fat, how much we've grown from some previous stage by looking at the number of terms in the initial expansion of F alpha. So that's G alpha, okay. But suppose we're getting to the point where that's still utterly huge, okay. We're already with BH, we're getting to the point where the GBH function 
was the same growth rate as f epsilon naught, which is not too shabby. And I think very few people would pretend that they have a really intuitive grasp of that one. Okay. Um, so, um, so suppose, oops, let's see, where are we? Yeah. So suppose we have the situation <clears throat> that G alpha, like I've been proposing, is exactly equal to F at some collapsed ordinal. So again, you can think of BH and epsilon naught as a good example of where, what this is going to look like. Okay. And so, and then C of alpha is still a big enough ordinal. We're really not that excited about trying to comp comprehend that directly. Okay. So we do it again. We say, okay, the number of terms in the expansion of the original fast-growing function itself is described by an unpleasantly fast-growing function. Let's just try to understand the number of terms that you would have to ex use to, for the initial expansion of that sucker, which, of course, is G of C of alpha. Okay, so now here's the deal. We can do it again. We are assuming that we're going to have this nice collapsing operation, and it is really going to happen. Um, so that, that's going to be described at f of c of c of alpha, or you could say that c squared of alpha. So we double collapse alpha, and we get maybe something that this is not so unreasonable. So maybe we have something like this, where um, the g of c of alpha actually maybe is just like f sub 3, which if you go back to the original definition of the fast-growing hierarchy, that's like a double up arrow. It's like a Knuth double up arrow. Okay, So we would say in this case, our original f alpha was this monster fast growing function. Its pale shadow was super big, but its pale shadow was something that's actually not utterly ridiculous. It's something on the order of a Knuth double up. Okay. Um, so it's definitely not a direct understanding. Ooh, uh, I want to say f3 here. I want to say f alpha. It's definitely not a direct understanding of f alpha, but you can see sort of a stage of replacing something with its shadow, replacing something with its shadow. Okay, and we could do this a number of times. Um, and we could do that repetitively, maybe not, maybe more than two times. Okay, so uh, in the next video, I'm going to talk about something that can, that happens if we allow ourselves to do that an arbitrary number of times.